Yeah, well, I represented uh, Nick Pileggi. And Nicholas Pileggi was a um, journalist for The New Yorker for many, many years. And his beat that he covered was the mafia. And Nick, because he was a journalist, would write about these guys. And he would have these people he'd write about who would want to tell their story. So he would say, oh, call Krenzman. He's my agent. He's a good guy. And you should call him about uh, your story, see what he thinks. So I would get these phone calls from guys in prison. Hey, Adam, it's uh, it's Jimmy Two Fingers. Uh, Dick said you're okay. <laughs> like, and, and I'd be sitting, like, you know, yelling at my assistant, you know, make reservations at the grill for lunch for two. I want the corner booth. And my assistant would say, there's a guy named Jimmy Two Fingers calling from San Quentin. <laughs> I'd be like, what? It would be so funny. It would happen, you know, once every six, eight weeks or so, like often enough, you know, three, four times a year. Sometimes the stories were good. They were all really nice guys, nice, friendly, funny guys. Faded? Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action! What's going on, everyone? And welcome to Restaurant Fiction the podcast that reviews every single fictional restaurant, bar, and club in TV and film, as well as talk about the screenwriting process. I am your host, Monis Rose, and today is a very special episode because we are not actually reviewing a fictional restaurant, bar, club, and TV and film. We're reviewing a fictional dinner party. Yes, that's right. Last Easter Sunday, to be exact, our restaurant fiction crew was invited to the hall residence. Yes, Annie Hall and her family invited us over, as well as our guest, Adam Krenzman. He knows the Halls. He knows Annie Hall and her family better even than us. So who is he exactly? Well, Adam is a former agent at CAA. He has repped some of the biggest directors, writers, producers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of our time. Well, Anyway, I can go on and on and on about Adam's credentials, but he tells them throughout this amazing episode, and we'll get to that at the end of this amazing episode as well. So without any further ado, here is the review, or our view more specifically, of our experience at the Hall Residence on Easter Sunday, as well as our interview with Adam. Enjoy. Yeah, you're oh, good. Okay. No, no, you're good. You're good. Awesome. Well, guys, so this is going to be a little quick review before we get into uh, questions with our guest with the most, if you will. It doesn't really rhyme, but oh, well, go with it. Anyway, we went to Sunday brunch, not just any kind of Sunday brunch. We went into an Easter Sunday brunch. And, you know, Easter Sunday brunch, there are some stereotypical foods, uh, kind of like a Thanksgiving. Uh, and really, really the food. I mean, yes, you're going to have your deviled eggs and you're going to have your glazed carrots, but really you're going to have the ham. And what kind of ham are we talking about? We're talking about a city ham. It's one of those hams where it's bone in. You just have to really reheat it and then you smother it with some kind of molasses sauce. It's very, very easy. Well, anyway, We actually dined and we experienced this ham at the Hall Residence. Yes, the Hall Residence. It was with uh, Grandma Hall. It was with Annie Hall. It was with the bro. It was with the dad. Now, it's really fine, but if you do bring, uh, say, a guest, you know, uh, the dinner party, um, you know, us at Restaurant Fiction, our whole tribe, if you will, is an eclectic bunch. And if you bring an eclectic bunch with, say, um, some dietary restrictions, maybe even religious dietary restrictions, uh, like, say, one of your uh, former fellows, one of your colleagues is a New York Jewish man who is um, more observed, say, dietary laws in terms of the Jewish dietary laws. Well, it might be a little, uh, make someone a little uncomfortable uh, eating this ham. But let me tell you something, the ham at the Hall Residence is really damn good. And when you're comparing it to the shoestring leather that you're used to, well, uh, I guess you got to go with the former. Well, anyway, that's the very quick review. Uh, Adam, what what about, so what do you think of this dining, the dining experience, this scene in Annie Hall? For me, you asked me earlier what resonates with me with that scene. I and my family just use that line all the time, which is 
the ham sauce was good this year. And I'm not sure that's a, a quote of the line, but it's pretty close. Every time there's an uncomfortable dinner or there's a little silence at dinner, I come from sort of a loud Jewish family. I'm more like the singer family, but we use that line and we'll sort of look at each other and it's like, we'll say the line, we'll just crack up. It's like our own little inside joke. And nobody else knows what we're talking about because the movie was what, made in 77, I think. So it's too old of a reference point for most, but we have a good laugh. What does it say about the characters? It shows how Woody Allen is trying to assimilate into the Hall family. And as much as he tries to assimilate, there are inherent differences between the Hall family and the Singer family. And I think that those differences is a lot of the theme of the movie. So I think that that scene, to me, is a perfect scene, which illustrates the differences that take place throughout the entire film, about him trying to fit in and not being able to and her trying to fit into his life. Say you're holding a dinner party with two uh, opposites. I don't even know, maybe polar opposites. I don't know, just cultures, if you will. How do you, how do you find the commonality and maybe even the comedy of errors? At a dinner party, there will always be differences with people. And you discuss them or argue over them, which makes it sort of fun and interesting as long as it's not about Trump or you know something where everyone's going to take sides and argue with each other. You asked me a question before we uh, got on the air a few days ago, and that is, have you ever had a dinner party and there's been people there that are not like-minded, or however you phrased it? And I have, um, I'd say about every six or eight weeks, I have people over at my place. You know, I get eight, 10, 12 people that haven't met each other or that know each other but not well, and I have dinner parties. So twice I've had incidences where there was somebody that just didn't fit in. One guy drank too much. He brought a bottle of, I don't know, whatever it was, vodka. And he drank the entire bottle. I was kind of thinking, well, I'm going to have a nice bottle of vodka at the end of the night, you know, put stash in the freezer. He drank the entire bottle where, you know, he couldn't walk down the steps. And another one where this woman went on and told a story about her dad and then where she grew up. And, you know, people were all looking at each other, rolling their eyes. So both instances, there was somebody there that turned the dynamic of the evening a great deal. So kind of just roll with it. Like that becomes part of the night. You know what it is? The fact that I'm here telling you that story makes it an interesting night. I'm not telling you the story about, oh, we all sat around and had a nice conversation with whomever. But those are the two nights that I remember. At any stage in your relationship with your clients, how important is breaking bread with them? Well, I always feel that restaurants and meals as an agent or as an executive as a, as a producer, are times and opportunities to build relationships. The phone is a tool to conduct business. So when I'm having a meal as an agent, okay, when I'm having a meal with a client or a prospective client, I want to go to a nice place. I want them to feel important. I want them to eat at some place that they wouldn't have otherwise eaten at. The Grill in the Alley is a restaurant that I would eat at, I would say, three days a week. Unfortunately, I usually get the same thing. Four, th three things. The Caesar salad with chicken with extra dressing on the side, because I like a lot of sauce in my stuff. I'd get the chicken piccata, comes with a big thing of broccoli, with extra piccata sauce on the side, a little of that lemon caper sauce. And there's a salmon there, and I think it's a salmon pesto, with extra pesto on the side. I like the sauce. So that would be a good place to take riders or potential riders. Also, because, and less so now, but at the time, you'd run into people there. So if you're there with a client or prospective client and you are either stopping at four or five tables or four or five people are stopping by your table to say hello, it makes you feel good and it makes your client or prospective client like, oh, I'm in good hands. I got the right guy. He knows everybody. So you want to go to places that you run into people and they run into you. Okay. So then there's also, um, if you're meeting with an executive, then it doesn't matter. Mary and Rob's on Westwood Boulevard. Perfect. So... If you're going out with a client or prospective client, it's one thing. But I think that executives meeting together, producers and executives, it's it just doesn't matter. You want to spend that time together and get to know each other better or talk about whatever you want to talk about. And um, the place is a little less important. I think now, for me, Porta Via on Canon has become the new grill. By the way, I get the same... I get the uh, same Caesar salad with chicken <laughs> and extra dressing on the side and a salmon there also. Is it really just that good? It's a good solid salad. The restaurant has a good vibe. Friendly. It's nice. Peter's always walking by everyone's table to say hello. The food is good. Waiters are on. It just all works nicely. 
And by the way, I feel the same way about La Scala, which is next door. But La Scala is like a Beverly Hills institution. It's been there since I was growing up, probably 30, 40 years. Different location. It used to be on the corner of Santa Monica and Rodale. And they had a fire there and they moved to this new location on Cannon. But Porta Vida is sort of the go-to Hollywood place, at least for me now. And when we first initially met Adam, uh, you said some of like the biggest deals or, you know, were not at places like the Grill or the Scotta. They were at, say, like, uh, this is not a specific example, but they were like at a Factors Deli, they, which is uh, not a low brow in any way, but it's more of just like a Jewish deli or the apple pan or something. How, how Is that true? Or? It's completely true. The Factors Deli is a really good example. Factors has been there for a long time. Debbie and Susie Markowitz now own it. And it is a go-to place for a lot of people. It's not overly expensive. It's fine deli food. And I think as many deals or close to as many deals are made at Factors Deli as there were at the grill in the alley. Why is it? Is it just the comfort situation? Is it where we're taking all of our gloves off? We don't need all the pomp and circumstance. I think that's exactly what it is. I think there's no reason to go and spend too much money at a fancy place if you know you're making a deal because you're there to conduct some business. You're not there to... So what I had said to you earlier was I look at meals as opportunities to build relationships that you then have for a long time. I like hearing about people's kids and their wives and their family. Now, if you're going to make a deal on something, then you're going to a restaurant for a specific reason. So you may or may not want people to see you. And you don't necessarily need to go spend too much money on something because you just want a quieter place where you can lean into the table and conduct your business and get your deal done. So Factors is a fantastic place for that. You wrote a food book. Tell me about this. So when I was in my 30s, I was a young agent at CAA, and I would have breakfast, lunch, and dinner out every single day. First house that I bought, and I lived in for two years, I never owned a refrigerator. I just didn't need one. So it dawned on me one day, well, I should write a restaurant review book. So every night I'd get home, I would sit at my computer, which was sort of new at the time. It was one of those big beige colored things. And I would write a review of the three meals that I had that day. After some period of time, I had about 110 reviews, and I called the book I Forked Hollywood. And I hired a storyboard artist to do renderings of what I wrote about each restaurant. They were sort of funny and campy, but so the right side of the page was the writing, and it looked like a script form. So it said interior, exterior, depending on whether it was indoor seating or outdoor seating, day or night, whether it was lunch or dinner. And it was the whole thing was written in the form of a script. And then on the left side of the page was the storyboard artist who did a rendering. And then I had, okay, well, if you're going from Warner Brothers to CA, here are the places you could eat in between. If you're going from Universal to William Morris, here are the places to eat in between. So I had it categorized by type of food. I had it categorized by where you were coming from or going to. I had it categorized by city. If I do say so, I thought it was pretty good. Problem was that I was calling publishers and it's different when you do it yourself. I was calling publishers and saying, hi, I'm Adam Krenzman. I met CAA. I wrote this really good book and I think it'd be great for you guys. And I got a lot of, okay, great. Sounds wonderful. You know, send it to us with a self-addressed stamp envelope and we'll get back to you in three or four months. And then computers started and Yelp came out and it was sort of a little too late. You know, I kind of missed the boat, but it was, uh, it was fun to write if nothing else. And it was fun to work on. Just in your mind, how well do you remember, say, um, the restaurants? You know, probably half the restaurants don't exist anymore, but that's okay because there's another half that do. And when you're writing about a restaurant and not just about the food, you have to look at it very differently. So what I found was I would start writing about a restaurant and then I'd have to go back there because when you're there, you're not thinking necessarily, you start to train yourself to, are there cloth tablecloths or are there no tablecloths? You know, were there candles or flowers on the table? Was it a high ceiling or low ceiling? Were the corners noisy? You think about it differently when you're actually writing about it. Because I wasn't just writing about the food. I was writing about the experience and the place. And I was writing about the bathrooms and the waiters. And could you see the kitchen? Is it an open kitchen or closed kitchen? And at the, at the beginning, I had to go back to a lot of the restaurants because you think you know, and you realize you really don't know. So that's what I learned from doing it. So if I were to do it again, and I, I think about it sometimes, I liked it. And I still have some copies of it. So some of the restaurants still do exist, like the grill. Le Dome, I would go to a lot, and that doesn't exist. And that, would, by the way, is a good in-between spot. Sunset Plaza was a good halfway spot between the agencies and the studios, which are you know, basically in Burbank and Studio City. What is your relationship with the writer? Today or as an agent? Both, yeah. What, what, whatever you feel more comfortable in answering. I always compare making a movie to building a house. 
And I look at myself as a general contractor. As a producer, you need to hire the subs. You need a guy who's going to do the wiring. You need a guy who's going to do the, the pipes. You need somebody who's doing the framing. And likewise, you need to have a writer and their script, which is the blueprint, which is also the foundation of that house or the foundation of that movie. You need a director, essentially an orchestra conductor. And you need all your subs, grips, gaffers, lighting, hair, makeup, the line producers. I mean, you need all of it. So the relationship with the writer is crucial. Without the writer, without the script, you have nothing. And to cultivate relationships with writers to get scripts that you can produce or work on or help other people set up, which I do also, some things I produce, some things I just help with the financing for other people. It's the key to all of it. You know, you, you see studios, they're not making overall deals so much anymore. I mean, Amazon and Netflix are, but oftentimes they're just writer and director deals. You know, they're the auteur. Without the writer, you don't have that foundation. You don't have that blueprint. So the relationship with the writer is the utmost importance. Without the writer, without the script, you, you're you sitting on your hands. Now, how can a writer enhance the role of the agent? Well, that's a really good question. So let's take Nick Pileggi. So Nick wrote, he wrote the book, um, Goodfellas. I think the book was called Wise Guys, if I'm not mistaken. The movie's Goodfellas. And he wrote the script for Casino. I adore Nick, and we had a really good relationship. And I would, it would help me raise my stature in the business or get other clients by saying I represent Nick Pileggi or, at the time, Mark Frost or Bill Condon. And so the better clients I had, and I represent more directors and writers. I'm mentioning a few writers now, but... I guess the writer directors at this point, but the higher caliber clients, and you're asking about writers in particular that you represent, make it easier for you to talk about who you represent, which enables you to get more clients. And also, as an agent, you have a job, and you get a paycheck every two weeks, and you don't want to lose your job. So if you have too many clients that aren't making money, you got to think about that also, because you're spending time and effort, and your assistant's time and effort, and emails or FedEx or, or phone calls or meals. And you have to look at that too, because agents have jobs. Managers oftentimes work on their own. You know, they have to kill for their food a little more. You're getting a paycheck and you want to hang on to that paycheck. So it's important to have money-making clients. And vice versa. So how can the agent enhance the role of, we'll, we'll say, I mean, the writer but slash client? I think agents are crucial and I'm not just saying this because I was one, because I'm not now, so I'm not, uh, I don't have a dog in the fight. You know, agents have relationships that enable these clients to go to work. There are several times throughout the history of our business, there has been a group of people who have decided to leave the agents and agencies and work on their own. Remember Paul Newman, Robert Redford, around that time there was a group of people, um, and they all came back. It's just, it's too difficult. Agents make the deals agents weed out the unsolicited projects and phone calls. Agents give advice to help build careers. Should I do this script? Should I not do this script? Agents put the cast together to enable those films to go. Agents take projects that are in turnaround and sell them at other places. They enable bidding wars for scripts. You're not seeing a lot of bidding wars for projects right now because of the ATA, WGA issues. So a lot of the writers have left their agents and the option on those scripts laps wherever they're set up. There's no one to go out and take it and sell it someplace else. It's a real issue for writers right now. Having been there for 20 years and having seen the results of a lot of writers that now do not have agents that are struggling, I think that says it all. What advice would you give a smart, driven, emerging writer? Or, and you can even uh, put even agents as well. Okay, so a smart emerging writer that does not have an agent, let's start with that. What I would say is, if you have a good script, or you have a script that you think is good, until you find somebody, work on producing it yourself. You're going to do the same thing an agent's going to do. It will be harder, and you won't get as many phone calls returned, and it'll be a longer process. But fundamentally, you're going to do the same job. So if you wrote a script that you think is right for Danny DeVito, maybe I could call Danny's company, and it's one phone call. But if you think it's right for him, call his agent, produce it yourself. And if you don't get a phone call back, try his manager. And if you can't get a phone call back, try the story department at one of those two places or somebody's assistant or his lawyer or his lawyer's assistant. You'll eventually find somebody to read it. If it's good, it will make its way to the right place and the right people. If it's not, then so be it. But do the work yourself. 
until you find some help. So if Danny or somebody reads it and likes it, well, then all of a sudden you have his agent or his manager or his lawyer helping you put the rest together because they have a client who's interested. So an agent or a manager could do it in a phone call or two or three, and it may take you five or 10 phone calls in several months. But to not do it yourself is to say, yeah, I just want somebody else to do it for me. It's your project. It's not their project. So my recommendation is produce it yourself until you find somebody else to help you with it. But just don't start off expecting or relying on somebody to help you with it. And what advice should they ignore? So what advice should they ignore? If you really believe in your project, ignore the advice of don't try harder, put it down, don't work on it, you know, find another career. At some point, you're going to have to come to that conclusion on your own if you're not making money or too many people have passed on your project. But I think it's a business that you're going to hear a lot of no's a lot of the time. And if you're not good with rejection, it's not the right place for you. So the advice is just forge ahead until you come to the conclusion that it's just not going to happen. And that will be after you get so many passes that you just can't help but to ignore it. How do, you, how do you stay consistently creative and not plateau? That's sort of easy to answer because for me personally, I have my fingers in a lot of different things. I work with a nonprofit coalition called Creative Future that was started by SAG-AFTRA and the DGA and IATSE and CVS and the studios to work on the behalf of the whole business's anti-online piracy efforts. I work with a company called MediaSeal that's encryption software. By the way, go to creativefuture.org and sign up. There's strength in numbers. And if any of you listening are writers or directors, then online piracy is a huge issue. It's free and no dues, no fees, and every voice counts. I'm sorry, I work with MediaSeal, which is encryption software that vents any kind of hacking and leaks into post-production. I produce movies as often as I can, once every few years if I'm lucky. And I have a cosmetic company that I've launched that will be on the market next year. So between all those things and looking and reading scripts that I find interesting, it keeps things alive and active all the time. And every script that you get in that you read is a different story. Sometimes it's a documentary. Sometimes it's a true story about it, which I have now called uh, a project called Saving Lace, which is a true story about um, a small town in Poland where they start making sexy women's lingerie, which for me is perfect because I grew up selling lingerie at a store called Playmates in Hollywood. My grandfather owned Playmates and when I was 15, 16, 17, I would sell bows and pasties to um, prostitutes on the street and guys that would walk in and women that would walk in, anybody. And I just remember they would walk out of the dressing room with like a little teddy on and like, how do I look? I would just sit there with my mouth open. I was like 16 at the time. Like, you look fantastic. I've never seen anything like it. So every script that you read is a different story and a new story. And, it, it's, and that keeps things alive. Adam, we're going on a food tour of LA. Where are you taking me? Where are the faves? So I would say Chaconis on Melrose. And I don't eat there that often, but I think it's good. It's solid. It's fun. I like the breakfast also. I think it's a late breakfast, but I like the breakfast. The Hillstone Group of restaurants, I could eat at every night. R&D Kitchen on, Mon on uh, Montana, Hillstone in Santa Monica, South Beverly in Beverly Hills. Those restaurants are great. They're consistent. The waiters are like militaristic great. The food is consistent. The ambiance is nice. Everything about it I love. I, I could eat at any of those restaurants every night of the week. Probably get the same thing, by the way. Salmon and asparagus. <laughs> right. I like eating breakfast. One of my favorite breakfasts, although I don't go very often, very rarely actually, but I love it, are the ricotta lemon pancakes at Shutters. Shutters at the beach. It's a hotel on Ocean Park and basically at the beach. It's worth going just to go there and get those. To the other breakfast places are the Larder in Brentwood, Marion Robbs on Western Boulevard occasionally. I like the Metro on Washington near Sepulveda. Everything's pretty solid. You are invited to the dinner party at the Hall Residence. What are you eating? Clearly, I got ham s sitting on my plate. I might be eating like the stuffing, actually. I might be eating the asparagus, the grilled asparagus. Well, okay, so the Hall family dinner would be ham, mashed potatoes and gravy, probably some kind of salad. What kind of salad would they have there? Just sort of a romaine, probably, with Ken's blue cheese dressing. I think that I would say even just iceberg. Wouldn't you say iceberg? iceberg? You're right. Ice, say iceberg. With, romaine's a little more gourmet. It's a little more gourmet. You're right. Yeah, iceberg, <laughs> iceberg with sliced tomatoes, 
Ken's blue cheese dressing. Oh, they probably a little crudite at the table also. Maybe some of those carrots and celery that's from Vaughn's with a little ranch dressing in the center and they, they peel back the plastic. I'd say I'd be eating, I'd load up on that. What about dessert there? What would they have for dessert, the Hall family? Ooh, a jello mold. Yeah, jello mold and maybe like a fruitcake. Yeah, pretty much. What I mean, are they going to have at the Singer family for dessert? Ooh. They're going to have fruit cobbler. So they're going to have with ice cream on it. Which dinner party would you rather go to? The one at the Singer residence or the one at the Hall residence? Are you really asking that question? Yeah. I mean, no, based on the food. <laughs> based on the food. Well, okay. So I'm having crudite with a Russian, with a with a with some kind of ranch dressing or fruit cobbler. With ice cream, I'm going to have to singers. Adam, is there anything else you want to say? Anything else you want to add? Anything else you want to plug? We had talked a while ago. If I were to produce a TV show, what would my dream restaurant be? And what would it look like? I thought about the answer to that question a little when I was driving over here. If I were to produce a movie in or about a restaurant, it would be a coffee shop. Because to me, coffee shops get wealthy people and less wealthy people. And they get business people. Everybody meets in a coffee shop. Whoever you are in life... So you got a great cross-section. Everybody at some point, no matter who you are in life, stops at a coffee shop. So I think that if you wanted to do a film or a television show about different personalities, different things that happen, whatever it may be, coffee shops are great settings for that because you get everybody in there. You can't do it at the grill because there's a group of people that you don't get at the grill. And you can't do it at McDonald's because there's a group of people you don't get at McDonald's. So it would be a coffee shop. Adam, thank you so much. I really appreciate having you. Thank you so much. It was great. My pleasure. Well, fuck a duck. That was an awesome interview, man. Adam, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you. I appreciate your time. And to all of you listening, what Adam said is truth. Go to his nonprofit. It's called Creative Future. And the website is creativefuture.org. What do they do? Well, they're committed to giving creatives a voice in conversations that impact our future. So whether you are a filmmaker, if you're a photographer, if you're a writer, a musician, musician, I'm pretty even sure magicians too, but really it's musician, Sign yourselves up. Once again, it is free and it only takes a minute tops of your time to really make a difference in your art and everyone else's art who is either a professional or aspiring artist. Guys, if you want to find out more about Restaurant Fiction, well, then just listen to any of our episodes. Please review us. Leave an awesome review on iTunes or wherever you hear this Restaurant Fiction podcast. Or you can also read our reviews on restaurantfiction.com. My name is Monis Rose, and as always, keep it real, keep it fresh, and keep it on the flip side. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar.